All right. Hey, whoa. All right. Can I talk? Is that weird? What do I do? Should I do that? That's all. Hey, is that better? Yeah. Hey, all right, let's try that. Um, just, yeah, how do I make it not loud? Do I do anything with this? I will. <laughs> <laughs> Any suggestions? There we go. Hey, there was the, what would you suggest? Okay. Testing. Is that okay? Still the same? All right, we'll go with this. We'll see what happens. Um, so I got to say, I'm a little nervous. I've never given uh, this talk before, and it's not related to uh, my book, so it's a little weird, or at least not directly related. Um, so for the past six years, I've been writing this website, FenleyAtheist.com. It's a blog. I post about current events and things related to atheism that I find interesting anyway. Um, but in that world that I live in, how many of you, raise your hand if you have a blog. Raise your hand, keep your hands raised. Raise your hand if you post statuses about and link to articles online. How about on Twitter? There's a lot of people. In some way or another, almost all of us share articles, comment on articles, write about things that are going on in the world. And I think as skeptics, as atheists, we could be doing a better job of that, and I include myself in that mix. And so what I want to talk about is kind of what I see as one of the big flaws that we have in kind of the, the atheist world where we write about things, talk about things that may or may not be related to atheism, but it definitely applies to us. Um, so work. There we go. Um, no, come back. There we go. Um, this guy's name is Mike Daisy. And um, he had this amazing, amazing show uh, about Apple computers and his obsession with them. And it was on This American Life. Did anyone hear that story when it aired? A lot of people, anyway. It, it was one of their most, I th if not the most, downloaded episode of This American Life ever. And this guy talks about how obsessed he is with Apple everything. He's an Apple fan. Um, and one day, he decided to find out, uh, in a short version of the story, he wants to find out where the stuff he loves comes from. So he actually goes to the plants where they make iPods and iPads. And according to his story that they aired, um, what he found there was devastating to him. Because he found they were using these like uh, poisons in the factory, and it was devastating the workers there. He met workers, he said, who were 12 years old, 11 years old. Um, and it's just uh, appalling that Apple would let this happen, even though it's overseas. So This American Life aired this story that's got a lot of press. But what happened next was more interesting to me. As amazing as that story is, it turned out over the next couple of weeks that there were a lot of lies in his story. And it turned out he, no one can verify that he met kids who were that young, as he claimed. Yes, there are young workers there, but not 11 years old. And his, part of his story said he met with the translator, and she helped him uh, navigate through China. And so one of the reporters, a guy totally unrelated, writes for like a business magazine that covers Apple, he Googled like translator in this part of China. First person that comes up is the person who is his translator. And so he asks her, hey, here's what the guy said. Here's a link to the story. Is all that true? And she's like, no. <laughs> it's like, oh. That's a big deal. And it's not just a deal for this guy who seemed to pass off the story as if it were true. It was a big deal for This American Life, which aired the story as if it were a true story. And so they're on the hook, too. So what happened is, a few weeks later, This American Life not only removed this episode uh, from their database, they issued a retraction. And what was amazing is they did a whole episode about the retraction. And they actually talked to Mike Daisy. He came into the studios. And you have Ira Glass, the host, saying, Mike, why did you lie to us? Silence. <laughs> Mike, you told me this. Uh, I mean, you told us, you know, I can't find the emails. I, we tried to fact check, he says, Ira Glass says. And then you told us, you know, I don't have those emails, or I can't put you in touch with my translator, um, or I lost touch with her, whatever. You lied to us when you did all these things. And Mike tries to respond. And This American Life airs that exchange with all the dead silence in between his responses and everything. 
And you know, at the end of the show, basically, they actually do a real report of what's going on at those plants, good and bad. Um, and Mike's essential explanation is, yes, there is some fiction mixed in with this overall truth that I'm trying to spread here. Um, and to his credit, I guess, Apple did respond to it. And they said, we are going to issue better ways to do quality control and make sure none of these uh, laws are violated, whatever. So yay for that. But This American Life ran this retraction episode. That became one of their most popular episodes then. And what's amazing is you know, they actually followed through with something they did that they were wrong about. And they said, you know, in the future, when we air a story, we're going to make sure it is fact-checked. And here's how we're going to make sure those stories are fact-checked. If it's a story, we're going to tell you it's a story, even if that kind of kills the mood or whatever. Um, so good on them. But the question is, how come they didn't fact-check to begin with, is one. And two, look at how they responded and how amazing it was the way they responded. And I think This American Life deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, this guy, the next one, go. There we go. Uh, that guy's name is Jonah Lehrer. He writes for The New Yorker. He's written a few best-selling books, very few of which you can now find on Amazon because his publishers have pulled them from Amazon because it turned out he was uh, making up quotations, attributing, attributing them to Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan never said these things. Um, and since that's a kind of a core of his book, it's like, wow, I can't believe Bob Dylan said those things that totally support your thesis. It's because he never did. Um, but here's what's interesting. This actually made a lot of news on the internet. Like Jonah Lehrer is making stuff up. And in some cases, he was writing blog posts for The New Yorker where he was, they called it self-plagiarizing. He had written articles in the past and then he was just kind of rehashing them and putting them on the New Yorker as if this is original work. And so he's plagiarizing from himself in a sense. But it's kind of a lie in the sense that, no, you're writing a blog post. We think this is new information or a new analysis. And it wasn't. And so here's what I found amazing. This happened. The publishers did what they had to do. Great. What I found the most interesting is there was a report about a month or two later after all this happened. And a reporter from the LA Times was writing about, what's Jonah Lair doing now? This guy is so talented, such a big name. Here, he could have been a big name. What the heck happened to him? So she contacted him, and Jonah Lair said this. Uh, this is Amy Wallace of the LA Times. When I emailed Lair to ask him what he's up to, what happened, he responded right away. Despite the avalanche of coverage, he said, I was only the third person to contact him for comment. Really, after all that's been written about Jonah Lair, she was the third person to actually ask him for his side of the story? How is that not the first thing everybody does in this case if you're writing about this? So kudos to Amy Wallace for contacting him. And then, to make it even better, another source, another like news media watchdog group said, huh, you're only the third person to contact Jonah Lair? We're going to fact check you, Amy Wallace. And so they did their own research. And Pointer, this group, said, how many journalists directly contacted Lair about these accusations? It turned out, by their count, the number was eight or nine. So Jonah Lair lied to Amy Wallace about <laughs> how many people had contacted him. Like, this is the whole web. But here's the thing. Again, his publishers could have fact-checked him. But they didn't, because they trusted him. This reporter could have fact-checked him. She didn't, because she got her sound bite, and she moved on to the rest of the story. Um, and what I think is interesting is, yes, the original story, very interesting. The fact checking and the reporting of that, way more interesting. And the follow through, like it's not even enough that they fact check it. They followed through with it. They talked to people who talked to Jonah Lair. And they got on the record like, no, Malcolm Gladwell of The New Yorker spoke to Lair about this. This other person spoke to him. We have the emails to prove that they contacted him. And this went on for a while. That story is way more interesting. So this idea of, why don't you get the truth before you put something out there? I mean, that's a basic journalistic standard. And granted, I have no formal training in journalism. But you would think that's something reporters ought to do. Um, and that sometimes doesn't happen in the blog world. So this is um, it's a nail polish put out by American Apparel. Um, and there's a guy named Ryan Holiday who has his own set of problems. But in this case, I think I'm on his side. He worked for American Apparel, and American Apparel a few years ago, a couple years ago, was going to put out this line of nail polish. They were very excited because this is like green friendly nail polish, and they wanted to really promote this thing. Not only that, they didn't go through their corporate offices. They actually found like a family factory, like the grandmother still works there. 
They were going to make these nail polishes and then distribute them around the country. And so this was going to happen. And before uh, it was out in the stores, they discovered that in the factory where these uh, nail polish bottles were made, the halogen bulbs were such that they actually cracked some of the bottles. Now, that's a big problem. It wouldn't be a problem if these things were in stores. But hey, you never know what the lighting is like in different stores. You can't always control that. They wanted to take no chances. So American Apparel, you know, uh, within their network, sent emails out to their managers saying, hey, store owners or whatever, uh, we already gave you these nail polish containers. There may be some issue there. So we want to make sure we give you the proper containers. Um, we're going to make sure we dispose of the nail polish or get the material safely back to us. We're going to dispose of these bottles. We'll take care of all that. We just want you to be aware of it, et cetera. This email got leaked to a website called Jezebel, really awesome feminist type of website. And here's what happened. The writer there, uh, apparently she found something else about American Apparel, but um, she contacted Mr. Holiday, and she said, our post with the initial information is going up shortly. But I would like, I'd be more than happy to post uh, a follow-up, happy to update or post a follow-up. Thanks so much, Irene. What she basically did is she said, we're going to post about how there's a problem with your nail polish. Can you give me some information? So first of all, good for her for contacting American Apparel saying, we're going to post on this, so give me some information on what's going on. That's awesome. The problem was, she number one, she wasn't posting about the breakage. She wasn't posting about the light. She was posting about, quote unquote, hazardous materials in the nail, po nail polish, which wasn't an issue. It wasn't an issue. The second thing is she sent this to him um, at 6.30 AM his time, and the post went up about an hour later. He woke up. It had already been up on their website for a couple hours. And when anything is up on Jezebel for a couple hours, you can bet it's all over the internet in a couple of hours. And so all of a sudden, this is the headline that appeared on Jezebel and therefore everywhere else in the world. Does American Ariel's new nail polish contain hazardous material? Question mark. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> But it doesn't matter because they posted all this stuff. Now, Ryan Holiday said he woke up to the story. He's like, oh my god, that's not what's going on. And he had, because it's a corporation, they have to have lawyers look through even an, uh, an explanation sort of email. So he drafted an explanation of what happened. He ran it through the lawyers. This took a couple of hours. But he got back to her and he said, look, you're wrong about this stuff. Here's what's going on. Here's how American Apparel is making it better. And so what did this author do? She added that, updated, with a little thing. Oh, by the way, it's not hazardous materials. Here's the note, which no one reads because you read the headline. You're done. And who's going to go back to a story that you don't even know got an update? Um, so here's a perfect issue where you could have fact-checked. You could have followed up on the story. But again, if you had gotten the truth that there's really no big issue here, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be an interesting headline. And it seems very apparent to me, anyway, that this writer was more interested in getting that headline out than getting the truth out. And as skeptics, as atheists, yes, it's not an atheist issue. We should be on the alert when those things are going on. It should be our job to get to the bottom of these stories whenever these sorts of things happen. Um, so let me give you a personal example of when this happened to me. Because I post a lot of current event issues. And I'm going to talk about things I've done or not done. Um, but here's one issue. Uh, this is Edwina Rogers. She's the uh, director of the Secular Coalition for America. Awesome group. They lobby on behalf of atheists, agnostics um, on, in Capitol Hill on Washington, in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's a Republican. And her background is that she's actually worked for a couple senators, a couple uh, high-profile Republicans in the party. And they, before they announced that she was going to be the new director, you can guess that they knew that you know, if they put her name out there and people found out that was her past, a lot of atheists might be upset about that. And they wanted to make sure that you know, uh, you know, she's not like a traitor. She's not, she is a Republican, but she believes in church-state separation. And if that's the case, OK, fine. Like, I'm interested in what she's doing now and what she's doing for us. Well, it turned out a Secular Coalition for America said, hey, Hammond, you can do an interview with her so that the day we announce that she's going to be the um, the new director, you can also post an interview with her on your site. Awesome, great. So I, I wrote up a whole bunch of questions, um, one of them being like, you worked for these high-profile Republican senators. How can we trust you to, 
to uh, be on our side on these issues because of all the things they've done that are so against the things I personally believe in. That's the gist of my question anyway. And she answered a lot of them in, a, in the way I guess you would probably expect. But uh, you know, this is her first day on the job. She hasn't done this sort of thing before. And a couple of the responses were a little strange at first because she said things like, well, you know, when I worked for them, I really, uh, they didn't, they were really weren't religious in that sense. They weren't trying to push religion through legislation. They're really, Republicans really aren't against church-state separation, things of that nature. My eyes rolling, like, really? Like, because that's not how I'm seeing it at all. But again, keep in mind, that's not the, the point I'm trying to make is, I sent those questions, I got the responses back, and I posted that that day. I think I got the responses maybe that morning, and I posted them not too long after that, because that's the post I was trying to get out. It was that interview with her. Well, not long after that, people started getting upset about that response, as they should have and as you might expect. What bugged me about it is that other bloggers, people that I know personally, were mad at me for not following up and asking her, like, what do you mean? That's not the case. Look at all the things Republicans have done in that sense. And I totally would have if this was a back and forth sort of interview. It wasn't. But the things out there, they're like, well, he's part of the John Stewart School of Broadcasting, doesn't really ask any tough, hard hitting questions. As if like I was aware of all this stuff going on. And so they posted stuff, not legitimate criticism against those responses, but I think unwarranted criticism against me for not following up with that because they didn't know about the nature of the interview. And what bugged me most about it is that these are people who could have easily emailed me and asked me that or called me up. It's not like I don't live on the internet anyway. <laughs> so, but no one did that. No one had the, the gall to like just say, hey, how did that interview actually work? How come you didn't follow up with that? It was a lot easier to just go on the attack and apologize or not apologize because it never happened later. Um, so that's one issue. Now, here's how I'm trying to do things to try to not be a, a, a suspect of that myself. You might heard of, uh, have heard of this guy. This is Terry Jones. A couple years ago, he had this, he's a Christian pastor, a fringe pastor. He doesn't have a lot of followers or anything, but he had this plan that he was going to burn a Quran on September 11th a couple years ago. This made news for the first time this was announced in the summer. It became international news a few weeks before 9-11. Like, if you've heard of this guy, it's because there was a lot of publicity about him those weeks leading up to it. But I heard about him a few months before this. And the first thought I had was, wait, you've got to be kidding me. A Christian pastor is going to do that? That seems like, pardon my French, a dick move. Like, why, why? Why would you do that? What do you get out of this? So, again, it would be very easy for me to just post about it. I do that a lot. I thought it would be more interesting if I could just get in touch with this guy and ask him myself. And it wasn't hard to do. I found the church he works for. I found his contact information. I emailed him and said, hey, I'm an atheist. I blog about stuff. Can I interview you? Yeah, OK. Oh, great. Here are my questions. It didn't change the fact that he's still kind of a jerk. He is a jerk. Uh, but he answered that. It was that easy to do. The guy doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know how many hits I get on the site. It doesn't matter. I asked him, and he answered stuff. And what was amazing is I'm like, no one else seems to be doing that. That's weird. Um, and it wasn't hard to do. Um, there was this girl named Amber a few years ago, uh, a Christian girl um, I, somewhere in the South. Uh, there was a newspaper article when I heard about her because she got in trouble because she was reading the Bible at lunch. And she got punished for that. Now, I think all of us can agree, if that's what she was doing, why is she getting punished? She can read the Bible at lunch. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we're on her side when it comes to that sort of thing. But the newspaper article I read this in um, said, you know, this girl got punished for it. We asked American atheist president, who at the time wasn't Dave Silverman, Silverman, it was his predecessor. We asked the president of American atheist, what do you think about this? And she said, and I'm paraphrasing here. Well, the girl was probably proselytizing or being annoying about it. Kids don't really read the Bible at lunch, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why would you say that? The answer is, fine, she can read the Bible. We have no problem with it. That's, that's the answer. Why are you saying all this stuff? Maybe the reporter was just trying to stir up controversy. Maybe she didn't actually say that. So again, the easy thing to do would have been, let's just post about that article. 
the easy thing to do that no one ever does is I emailed the president of American Atheists, who just like anyone in this room right now, we all probably have access to, the email's on their website, and I said, hey, um, is this actually what you said? Because I read this in a report, I just want to get your side of it. Did they misquote you? Because if they misquoted you, that would have been a way more interesting story. Um, and her response was, I said it. Like, all right then. Um, but just imagine, like, we talk about all the time, we get, uh, I forgot who I was just uh, talking to over at lunch, uh, maybe it was Jesse out there, who said there was an article where they talked about an atheist, but the, uh, or a Christian critic of the Bible, and it said, like, arrogant scholar, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that's a weird decision by the headline writer. Why would you say that? Go call the editor. It's easy. The newspapers have contact information on their website. And Jesse said, yeah, we just sent something out on Twitter, and they got back, and they apologized for it. And they said, we are changing that as far as we can do it. Good. It's that easy. Um, so I wrote this book that uh, they mentioned earlier, Young Atheist Survival Guide. And it's a lot of stories about high school students and the stuff they have to deal with. And what was fascinating, again, is I know a lot of stories about high school atheists that have to deal with a lot of obstacles, church-state separation issues. But what I got to do, and what I'm urging everyone to do, is don't just stop at the story. Fact check it, follow through, see if you know, you're missing anything that was reported. And so one of the stories I had read about was about this girl named Chelsea Stanton. Um, she lives in, I believe, New Jersey. And in New Jersey, she was in high school as a senior. She didn't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. OK, fine. She's an atheist. She didn't want to stand up for the pledge. Her teacher punished her and actually assigned her three detentions because of it. OK, that's not right. Chelsea had the wherewithal to email like the New Jersey Rights Commission and say, hey, I just got detention for this. And they responded back and they said, they totally can't do that. Here's the documentation to prove it. Um, show this to your administration. and." Let us know what happens. And she did. And you know, they basically said, you know, well, we won't give you detentions, but that's about it. They're not going to change their policy on anything. So she contacted the news media. And they followed up. And this is where I heard about her, because the news media said, look at what happened to this girl who stood up for her own rights by not standing up for the pledge. And she got in trouble from her school. When the media came, the school board actually changed the whole policy to make sure it said, kids don't have to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. So how awesome is that? We want students to be activists like that. And that's where the story ended. And if that's all we were reporting, then OK. So I called up, I, I emailed with Chelsea after all this happened. And I'm like, hey, so what's going on with you now that you're graduated? Because um, that was her senior year. Like, what's going on with you now? Um, and what she told me was way more interesting than anything that the news media actually reported about. Um, Many of uh, her parents and family members have ceased communicating with me or have insisted that I'm an idiot and worthless, idiotic and worthless child that needs to repent. The worst part about it, the entire thing is that I was kicked out of my house the day I graduated. My father's girlfriend refused to have an atheist living with her. She thought God would set the place on fire. Um, I, yeah. I was planning on living at home, but the cards are dealt. She's actually living in an apartment on her own and working like a full-time job and not going to college because she's got to support herself somehow. That story never got told anywhere. And, and I'm not saying like, oh, look at me. I'm saying no one asked her what happened after the story ended because the story to most people was done when the policy got changed. And there was this whole way more interesting story happening in the background that no one has written about. Um, and I think that's something that we ought to be cognizant of, that there's all these things happening um, just to name someone that is maybe familiar to you guys, we all heard about like Jessica Alquist's story uh, over the past couple of years. But I'm guessing you probably haven't heard of anything she's doing in like the past several months because that story's kind of done. And I think there is another story to be had there for anyone who actually asks her how she's doing or just anything like that. Those follow-up stories are way more interesting. Um, one more just about this. There was a New York Times article about Rutherford High School in Florida it's one of, at the time that this article was written in a 2011, about uh, two years ago, uh, this was one of the very few high school atheist groups in the country. And they have this beautiful article about what this group does, how positive it is in the school's community. Um, this, the faculty sponsor was awesome. The students seemed very uh, eager to be part of this group as well. Um, and at the time that I saw this, the two parts that stood out to me 
were this quotation from one student, um, students who don't want their parents to know what they're doing after school. I tell my parents I'm at Ocean Club. Like, really? You got to lie? At Ocean Club? Like, really? That's the one you choose? <laughs> what does that do? I don't. OK, and another student who had a military parent, she didn't want her dad to find out. So she asked that her name not be used for fear it would hurt her father. I don't want us to grow apart over this. That's a heartbreaking thing for a kid to say. And it, it kind of does shed light on the plight of what these students are going through. What this article didn't talk about is how this group really got started or what's going on with the faculty sponsor. So again, there's a story out there that no one else was talking about. And all I did is I emailed the faculty sponsor and I said, hey, like, so what else is happening here that we don't know? How did you end up starting this group? What's your story? Um, and have you gotten any flack for any of this? And what's amazing is he told me the way this whole thing even got started, the way students even found out he was an atheist, is that for, he's been teaching at this school, Rutherford, for like 30 years. Uh, he's a popular teacher there. Kids know him. They love him. Um, and he teaches like a philosophy type of class where they get to have discussions about things and he plays the moderator as he should. And at one point, you know, every year kids always ask him when they talk about religion, you know, Mr. Creamer, what do you believe? And he always says, you know, my beliefs are irrelevant. So I'm going to stay out of this. You guys have it out and I'm just going to moderate and stuff. At, which seems like a very politically correct answer. Like that sounds fine. But what was interesting is when those kids ask their other teachers what's going on, they never got that response from their other teachers. Like, oh, what do you believe in? Oh, I'm a Christian. I go to this church. You should come with me sometime, or something like that. Like, they all said that. And once Mr. Creamer realized this, he's like, why am I the only one who's like shy about just saying what I am? I'm not telling anyone to be an atheist. I'm just, why am I hiding who I am? So finally, after all these years, the kids asked him, what do you, where do you go to church? And he said, I don't go to church. Actually, my wife and I are atheists. And the kids are like, Oh, and they moved on. Like, <laughs> it's not a story. It wasn't a big deal. But that's fascinating. And he said a couple students eventually came up to him and said, we want to start a group for atheists, so can you help us out? And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll help you out. You take the lead, but I'll, I'll help you out. Um, and even more interesting, he said, uh, after this story aired, so many uh, people sent him books like for uh, resources for the students in his group. Uh, so things like Sam Harris books, Richard Dawkins books, so that they could read them because they may not have access to them otherwise. And he said he had like an entire bookshelf full of them somewhere. But again, a fascinating story that all it took was just an email to reach out to this guy. And it was so easy to do. And I'm amazed that it doesn't happen more often. Um, and I'm learning that too. Like all it takes is just reaching out to people and they'll respond. How many of you know this guy? Yes, that's the right response. <laughs> <laughs> That's David Barton. He's a, a, a historian, in big quotation marks. Um, his book about, like, I think Thomas Jefferson actually got pulled by his Christian publishers because it had too many lies in it that they couldn't support. Um, and David Barton's been doing this for a long time. So I think just last week he uh, was on a radio show or something, and he said something to the extent of there was a Supreme Court case that eventually took prayer, mandatory prayer, out of public schools, Abington v. Shemp. And he's saying that one of the things they said in that case, in the Supreme Court, is that the reason the Bible was removed from school is because it was psychologically, uh, psychologically damaging to children. Which is, that's weird. Like, I don't remember ever hearing that as an excuse. Like, there's a lot of reasons not to have the Bible in school, but that seems weird. Well, it turned out if you actually did the fact checking, which a lot of websites like Right Wing Watch ended up doing, the person he was referring to was a counselor who said, if you are making Jewish students read the uh, New Testament and things, that and telling them that they are going to go to hell if they don't believe in Jesus, that could be damaging to Jewish students. Furthermore, it wasn't part of the Supreme Court case. It was something that happened in a lower court. And when the Supreme Court uh, judges are writing their ruling, they talk about the history of the case and what was said in earlier trials. So when they reported on this guy who said this thing, they were just saying, this is what happened like years ago, and this is what happened a year later, and then here's what we're going to do about it. It was part of the history. It wasn't even part of the ruling. So everything Barton said was just a total inaccurate like distortion of what was actually going on. So the question is, who do you talk to to get a response to something like that? I, for me, it, was hard, it would be very hard to reach David Barton. I, I don't even know how I would contact him, but I could easily 
talk to someone at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. I could easily talk to the Freedom From Religion Foundation because, again, we all have their websites. We all have, they all have contact email information on their websites. But even better, I was like, who would know about this better than anybody else? Well, if the case is Abington v. Shemp, let me talk to Shemp. <laughs> Shemp is around. Shemp is awesome. <laughs> Ellery Shemp, I was like, hey, Ellery, this guy said this about the case you helped bring up. Um, so what do you say about him? And he gave me the greatest soundbite ever. Barton Rakes in Millions has the moral compass of a cockroach and wants us to believe he has God's direct email address. I never thought the Genesis story made any sense, and I didn't used to believe in talking snakes, but then Glenn Beck and David Barton came around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Here's, here's so I can't believe I wasn't doing this earlier, and I'm urging you all to take this next step. When you read a story, and especially to those of you who might go into journalism, those of you who might write about these things or recap them for places, don't stop where the story, where you think the story ends. It was so not hard for me to get in touch with Ellery and just say, hey, Ellery, do you have anything to say about this? Yes, he did. <laughs> And it made for a way more interesting story because all those same websites that reported on David Barton, they said, oh, whoa, Ellery Shemp responded to the same thing. So it resulted in more hits for that story because that was a more interesting follow-up than anything else that was going on. And the reason he mentions Glenn Beck is because David Barton's book with all the distortions is now going to get published, republished by Glenn Beck's, he has a book imprint now, I guess. Um, there's a reporter named Jim Romanesco. He's an old media guy. He's been, uh, he's been a journalist for many, uh, I think, decades. And his, he is probably the best blogger that I read um, by far. He covers the news media. That's his beat. He covers the, the world he used to work in. And what's amazing about him and why I'm just so fascinated every time I read his uh, blog is because he doesn't just write stories about interesting things going on in the news media. It seems like every story has a follow-up. And so this is a cover of, I think, last week's New Yorker. It's the Pope. He's on vacation. You know, he's, he's gone. That's the cover they had. Well, it turns out, it turns out, if you look carefully, where is his right hand? Is it reading a paper? <laughs> or is it doing something else? And that's what someone wanted to know, because they were like, dude, uh, that's, that could be mistaken, or maybe that was intentional. I don't know. It's a little uh, scandalous there if he's doing something else with his right hand. And even the guy's like, hey, look at the New Yorker cover. And Romanesco wrote this conversation he had with the tipster. He's like, tipster, hey, did you look at the cover? Yeah, I see it. What's up with it? Do you, you see it? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> look at his right hand. I still don't get it. Look, oh. <laughs> but here's the thing. So that story went around the world for like a little bit on the internet world. What was amazing is Jim Romanesco actually contacted the guy who drew the picture, uh, Barry, uh, Blatt, uh, Barry Blitt, and he said, hey, what's up with this? And <laughs> Blitt wrote back, oy vey, not intentional, <laughs> cross my heart, had nothing to do with it. Which again, that, that last line, just the fact that the, the guy who drew the picture said, not what I meant to do. If, anything, if you're seeing anything, it's not really because I meant it to be there. That's a story. Uh, another example is maybe you saw this going around Reddit the other day. Yeah. I don't know how that's supposed to be a G, even if you wanted it to be. Yeah, apparently crepe fruit is good for every meal. But here's the thing, that went around everywhere. Because like, how did no editor at, at this newspaper see this and put a stop to it? <laughs> like, it's not cute. It's not. And obviously, they weren't actually thinking it, people were going to see the word rape. But someone thought it would be cute to do this. And hey, it might be cute. But unintentionally, that's what happened. It's like, how did no one pick up on that? So again, what did Romanesco do? His first thought was not, let me just post that because it's funny. His first thought was, well, let me check out who the editor of this page is. Let me contact that editor and see what they were thinking. And he did. And even though this is a non-story, uh, this is what Romanesco wrote. I got an auto reply to my email to Mankato, Minnesota Free Press editor, Joe Spear. Hello, I'm sorry I missed your email. I'll be out of the office until March 11th. Good idea, Joe. <laughs> All he does that fascinates me is he doesn't stop where everybody else stops. He takes one more step 
he contacts the people involved just to get their side of the story, because more often than not, he can get in touch with them, and what they respond with is way more interesting than what the original story may have been. Um, so something I've also tried to do. I hear a lot of things about what goes on at churches. I visited a bunch of churches myself back in the day, um, but sometimes we all, as atheists, humanists, whatever, we hear things about what goes on in evangelical churches. We hear things about what goes on, what go on at uh, Christian conferences, and it's very easy to just say, look at all the crazy stuff that you think they're doing, because you might hear about it secondhand. Well, it's way more interesting if you can fact check this somehow. So what do you do? Um, one time, uh, I uh, sent people and I said, hey, there's a Christian men's conference in Texas. I think I know what's going to happen. But is there any of my readers who would be willing to go there? I'll totally cover your registration if you'll write back to me what actually happened. So one went there and actually saw all this stuff happening. That's neat <laughs> message and mayhem. Um, and I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> I guess that's in the Bible? I don't know. Um, there was one other time that it turned out right in my neck of the woods. There was an anti-gay conference going on. And what this group was trying to do, um, there's a group like Americans for Truth About Homosexuality, where they spread lies about homosexuality. Um, they were hosting an event um, not too far from where I lived. And what they wanted is they wanted to train young people to be anti-gay activists for like the next generation of anti-gay activists. which interesting because I would totally attend that conference just to see what's going on but I think they would be on to me so again it's like hey does anyone want to go I'll cover your registration if you want to go and it turned out there were two people in my neck of the woods who said oh yeah I'll go to that thing and I'll report back so they both went there um, and they got everything they got the they got the pamphlets they got the binders they got everything and they said you know what we heard was just Amazing. I mean, it was disturbing. It was ridiculous, the, the facts they were using, the quotes they were using. But they wrote it all up. And that story, again, wasn't happening because this is a closed door conference, but they got in. Um, what was very interesting is that there was a guy and a girl who went there for me. And we met up at one point, and uh, I was talking to them. And the, they tell me a story that, you know, there weren't a lot of young people at this conference. It was a lot of older people who were there. And um, the, the girl said, yeah, there was one girl who was asking really good questions. Like, I have a friend who's gay, and I don't know what, I'm in high school. I'm, I have a friend who's gay. I don't know what to do. Like, what should I say to my friend? Very heartfelt, emotional type of questions. And they would get answers. And if any of you heard those answers, I'm guessing, you'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, don't, don't do that. Um, but amazingly, this girl asked a couple questions. My girl, who was there, ended up striking a conversation with this person during lunchtime and so on. And at the end of the day, it was like uh, the person who was asking questions came up to my person and said, hey, it was nice meeting you. Um, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm actually not going to be coming for the next couple days. I'm actually here reporting for a website. <laughs> <laughs> to which my person says, no way, I'm here for a website. <laughs> and so is my friend over there. To which the first girl responds, no way, so is that guy over there. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody actually, um, I told someone that they sent me this article from The Onion, Klan rally, 70% undercover report. <laughs> but again, the idea here being, I know we think we know what's going on at churches, at these anti-gay things, at protests, whatever. It's a way better story if you can be there yourself or have someone go there for you or something just to see firsthand what's going on. And that means whether it's going to a political rally of the side you don't believe in. It means going to, if you're you know, pro-choice, going to a pro-rights conference. Just checking out what it is firsthand because people want to hear those stories. And it just takes that additional bit of follow through. They didn't lie about who they were. They just happened to have ungoogleable names. Um, and it turns out, hey, we're sending more people to more conferences. Um, so it's still happening. It's fun. Um, so lessons I, I just want to take away from all this stuff. What, how does this, all this stuff apply to everybody? First thing is fact check. Um, we're skeptics. We should be the first people on the lines to fact check stuff we see. 
And that means, you know, and I'm sure if you went through my site and I'm sure if you went through my Twitter history, you could easily point out places I have not done my job. So I'm not saying I'm good at this. I'm just saying it's a good standard to live up to. Whenever you hear a story, it's very easy to say, look at Snopes. This email isn't right because I have evidence of what's actually going on. We don't, t we don't go to Snopes when someone tweets something or sends a link out. We, we just don't. We go ahead and retweet it and we're done with it. Or if you post something on a website, it's very easy to just paraphrase what some reporter already said about it instead of doing the due diligence and checking it themselves. I understand not everyone has time to do stuff, but if you're in a business where you are doing that sort of thing, if you make a living as a reporter or a writer of some sort, it really isn't always that hard to fact check um, on at least some of the basic things that are going on. Don't take everything you hear as gospel. And I shouldn't have to say that to this crowd, but it seems like we don't do that as much as we'd like to think we do. The next thing is just follow through. If there's a story that is going on, or a story you hear about, or a story that your friend writes about, or you know, there's a status update and you're like, how could they say this, or whatever. Follow through, find out if it's actually real or not. And I'm telling you, uh, this is probably the biggest lesson I've learned in the past few years. It is so easy to talk to people involved with all the media stories you see about anything. Um, even if I don't have direct access, if I heard a story now, if I read a story about some secular student alliance group doing something amazing, all I have to do is Facebook their name and I have access to them. If there's any story about just about anybody, it's very easy to Google them and just find them. Um, and just ask them, hey, did they represent you correctly? Or is there anything they didn't say? And especially if I disagree with somebody, or especially another blogger, probably someone who's also on the internet a lot, it's very easy for me to shoot them an email and say, hey, um, I have issues with what you said about this. I want to post about it. But before I do, here are my big concerns. Can you just tell me if you have any response to them? Because I'm telling you, it's way better to have an argument online if you say, here's what I have problems with that this other person said. And I asked them about it, and here's how they responded. And here's my rebuttal to that. That conversation is way more civil and way more informative than what you tend to see online everywhere, which is just sniping and bitching and moaning. Um, so just follow through. It's so easy to contact just about everybody these days, so do it. Um, ask questions all the time. Um, and this kind of follows through with the fact checking thing, but you would think in a group of skeptics we'd be asking questions all the time. And a lot of times I think when we see a story that we agree with or we want to believe is true, um, we tend not to do that because we assume it's right. Um, that story about Chelsea, that girl from New Jersey, if I didn't ask her what was going on with her life, I don't think I ever would have found out what's happening there. And it wasn't hard to do. And the last thing is just admit your mistakes. If you do like a nail polish post and you made a mistake about it, don't just do an update if it's a big freaking deal. By the way, after she posted that thing, despite the update, that plant that, that was making all that uh, nail polish, they got under so much pressure for this hazardous materials that they didn't have there. Um, that they eventually had to just shut down the entire line of marketing. They had to go to a different uh, factory to make that nail polish. It was a whole debacle, cost millions of dollars for the company, and it probably all could have been prevented if the writer of that article had just asked them what's going on. It would have taken a couple hours, and that's it. Um, so the title of my talk was Post First, Ask Questions Later. Um, I mean, don't do that. <laughs> um, so I think I'm done. That's it. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. I'll step away from you. <laughs>